Hello YouTube folks, welcome to my channel. My name is Steph and today we're going to be doing another book rant. And today we are talking about, here, here's my beautiful edition, The Picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde. This edition is really cool. I got it at Goodwill and it is the, let me see if I can find it, Barnes & Noble Classics Edition. You can see the seal right there. From, I believe it's 1995, yeah. You can see 1995. So it's pretty neat. It's not like a super rare edition. I wouldn't get like a bazillion dollars for it, but I thought it was cool and the art on the front is really, really neat. There's a bit of junk right there, but that's fine. <laughs> so yes, today we are book ranting and the reason for this is i have notes here so if you see me like looking it's because i don't want to forget anything <laughs> the reason i'm ranting about this book today though is because i'm trying to catch up on some classics because i feel like i'm really behind especially on well-known ones i read a lot of really obscure ones when i was in high school studying literature and i feel like i'm behind so i'm trying to catch up oh if you hear a bell that's my cat <laughs> she's looking for me I want to catch up on classics that's my one of my reading goals for 2024 is to read as many classics as I can muster so I wanted to read the picture of Dorian Gray because it was a huge read for a lot of people back in October of 2023 when we were all reading oh here she comes hi hi <laughs> is it okay if I film no I'm not allowed to film. Hello. Do you want to say hi to the camera? I know you hate me. Just go. Hello. Oh, oh, oh. Can you say hi? Hello. <laughs> I'll put you down. I'll put you down. I know. Okay. Farewell. Oh my gosh. Distraction after distraction today, huh, folks? Anyway, I'm trying to catch up on classics. A lot of people read. Dorian Gray, picture of Dorian Gray in October as like a spooky Halloween read. And I just didn't give her, I'm too excited. So many other spooky books I wanted to read in the fall Halloween time. So I picked this up early this year, Dorian Gray. I listened to an audiobook, which I feel like works better for me with classics audiobooks because to hear like an actor's vocal in inflections really activates kind of what's going on for me. I know a lot of people get lost in the sauce with classic books. But I feel like audiobooks work well with me, so I picked this one up. It's not a long read, and it absolutely was not at all what I expected it to be. A lot of people praise it for being like a catalyst for the gothic genre. It's horror. It has very philosophical themes. I referenced Spark Notes for a lot of my notes about themes and plot because I didn't want to be incorrect in my interpretation of the story. Not that there, there is a correct way, obviously, but I'm not a literary scholar, you know? Like, I'm just a, you know, academically educated woman who reads a lot, but doesn't like study literature for a living. And obviously a lot, a lot of people are credited with really great interpretations and research on classic literature, especially the one book by Oscar Wilde. So I just wanna put that out there. I did do my own little bits of research with SparkNotes. I did read the book. Obviously I read a lot, so I feel like I have, you know, the platform to have my opinions, but I will say, you know, as a disclaimer, I am not like a brilliant literary person. <laughs> so the plot of this book, full spoilers. Ah, run for cover. Full spoilers. I'm just gonna read you my notes, ready? So it's set in the present time of London that Oscar Wilde wrote this in, which is 1890. It follows this man's life, Dorian Gray, from when he's like really young, I think he's like 17 or 18, all the way until he's, you know, an, an older man. He gets a painting done by Basil Hallward. Hallward, is that how you say it? He gets a painting done by Hallward. There's a lord with them. Lord Henry and Lord Henry and Hallward are kind of foils of each other. Henry is very cynical and hedonistic and Hallward is very optimistic and creative and like 
loves beauty and youth and nature and that kind of stuff, right? They're foils of each other. And it's clear that Dorian's kind of caught between their two theories on life. Henry's, that's like, you know, please yourself because you only live so long. And Howard, who's like, be a good person and try to make a creative, positive impact on the world. And Dorian falls in love with this actress named Sybil Vane. And she's this incredible actress and it's explained that he falls in love with her because she embodies every heroine that he admires and dies every night and comes back to life as a new one. So she's like a million women in one, which is a bit of a shallow reason to love somebody, but I'm not, mm, 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 mm opinions to myself for now. <laughs> he proposes and he's like, Lord Henry, Basil Howard, come with me to see a show that my new fiance is in and I want you to watch how incredible she is as an actress. And they're like, hell yeah. So they go see her show and she's bad. She's so bad. She's so bad in fact that Dorian confronts her afterwards and is like, I'm breaking off the engagement. Like, why did you do this to me? He's like so upset with her and she, she says the reason why she acts poorly is because she can't act love anymore now that she's experienced true love. Like, she feels like acting isn't worth it and all she wants is to be Dorian's wife. But he breaks off the engagement. Also because of, you know, the embarrassment in front of these two men that he looks up to and that influences his life heavily. So... Dorian goes home, he sees the painting that Howard made of him and sees that something's changed about the painting, like it looks like it's sneering it's described as. And Dorian immediately recognizes this as a result of his confrontation and engagement ending with Sybil. So he's like, oh my god, I don't want to be a bad guy. I'm not going to follow in Lord Henry's footsteps. I'm going to follow in Basil Howard's footsteps. I'm going to be a good guy. I'm going to go back reignite our love and apologize and I will marry her so as to not ruin her reputation. And besides, I was being silly, it's it's just acting. He goes to apologize Sybil, finds out she killed herself. This sends him to, into a spiral and he ends up following in Lord Henry's footsteps. He becomes hedonistic and cynical and cruel and very much like a morally, <laughs> I'm not gonna say gray, morally bad character, he's a bad dude. He is given this book by Lord Henry that is about, there's theories about if the book is real, if it's based on something real. Theorists believe it is based on this real like French book or whatever, but it's about this man who gets away with a lot of murder and crime and stuff. And Dorian obsesses over this book, it becomes like his Bible, he follows in the Lord Henry's theoretical and philosophical footsteps and follows in the literal footsteps of this book. He buys like a ton of copies. And then we have like this random time jump. Like you don't, you don't hear anything about all the crime he does. It's just like, he lived a bad life. He's a bad man. Tisk tisk. But you don't actually hear any stories about this. You just hear that, you know, a couple decades pass the picture continues to grow uglier and older as Dorian stays young and beautiful and gets away with a lot of stuff because he is young and beautiful, right? And he commits crimes, apparently. We don't really know anything about him. We know he like hangs out in opium dens and obviously hangs out with Lord Henry, who is not a great guy. Anyway, so then Basil Howard decides to catch up with Dorian and he's like, hey, I heard you're like not a good guy anymore. What the heck happened? You used to be so, you know, sweet and impressionable when you were a kid. And Dorian is like, you want to see my soul? And shows him the picture and then stabs him. He blackmails some guy who is just so irrelevant to the plot um, to take care of Basil Howard's body. He then sees, I think it's James Vane, Sybil's brother, I don't know. Sybil's brother also is like not really a relevant character, but he appears and he's like, you're Dorian Gray, you caused my sister to kill herself, I'm gonna kill you as vengeance for my sister. And he's like, that was so many decades ago, oh my god, look how young I am, you have the wrong me and we must just be like lookalikes, it's not me. Dorian gets away with it. And then somehow, this isn't very clear, but somehow like while Sybil's brother is like pursuing Dorian, Dorian gets a hunting group to kill him. So he like inadvertently kills Sybil's brother, who I believe is named James. So he kills two people. And then he, you know, freaks out because he's old and killing people and going crazy, whatever. And he 
has this like this this was actually a really well written part of the book i'm not gonna lie i'll get into the pros later but this part was really beautiful he like confronts the painting he's like has this monologue where he's fighting with it talking about like his woes in life about the painting he goes to take with the knife that he killed basil howard with he takes that knife and he tries to stab the painting but ends up actually stabbing himself commit he commits suicide and people hear the screams outside come into his home and they see the knives in an old, ugly, decrepit man's body and a picture of a beautiful young Dorian Gray. Ooh, I have chills on the wall. So that's the plot, y'all. That's the plot. Not a ton happens. Let's get into it, y'all. Let's get into my controversial opinions about Dorian Gray and how I feel like a lot of people kind of disregard what I feel like is blatantly obvious and just call it like a, ooh, this really incredible gothic romance horror book. When I feel like it's not. I feel like in the lens of today's society, it has very different implications. Let's get into it, y'all. Okay, so here are my pros. Here is what I did enjoy about the book. I did like that ending. Like I said, I got chills just talking about it. I think it's very cinematic. I think it's a great metaphorical plot twist to Dorian's like life and then how it ends. I liked the ending. Very Oscar Wilde, right? I also really liked the very beginning after we meet Henry, Lord Henry and Basil Howard, and like you see Dorian in love, like I thought that little chunk was cute, and then like the confrontation, like that felt very, you know, literary and exciting, and, and like the, the plot there was well made. It was well made. So maybe what I'm saying is the plot is good. My issues are with the philosophical implications and the discussions of like the nature of humanity and ego. Let's get into my negatives. So I kind of have this baseline disagreement with a lot of the generally agreed upon concepts for this book. I'm gonna read you the themes that are written by the literary god Sparknotes. Themes of exploring morality, consequences of unchecked desires, philosophical discussion of the soul, supremacy of youth and beauty, and consequences of being impressionable instead of single-minded. I really only agree with two of those. Exploring morality, like where? Like there was no back and forth. He, Dorian very quickly decided to be a hedonistic asshole and do crime. There was no like, like the betrayal of a betrayal, right? Of a woman, I'm gonna be bad. There was no point where he was really good. He went from impressionable and young to bad and make having made up his mind. So there's no exploration of morality. And you hardly have any discussion with Basil Howard. He's hardly there as like, you know, the foil of Henry. He's hardly there, hardly like speaks his mind or argues with Henry's point. Except for like the very beginning when he's painting Dorian, which really the whole time it's homoerotic, like, oh my God, Dorian, you're so gorgeous. Beauty is everything. Like that to me doesn't have some sort of exploration of morality. That's just an exploration of not having morals in my opinion. <laughs> the discussion of the soul concept, I don't, I don't know if I agree. It feels like, it feels like Oscar Wilde's trying to say that morality and the concept of the soul is black and white. Like you're either good or evil. There's no like, you make mistakes and you do good things just like kind of humans are. Like to have a man and then to have a painting feels too black and white for me. Like that doesn't ex truly explore the intricacies and the complexities of the soul or so you can in, in literature. And I feel like there are ways to do it in much more nuanced and metaphorical ways instead of just being like, the painting is, is getting all the after effects of me being bad and I'm experiencing nothing because I get away with it. Like that to me doesn't explore anything about the soul. And then the whole idea of like the supremacy of youth and beauty, <sighs> Again, I feel like it could have been more nuanced. It felt very like in your face, like he gets away with crime because he's pretty and never ages. And I don't know about y'all, but I've seen plenty of ugly old dudes who get away with 
murder. You know what I'm saying? They get away with international crimes, if you understand my implications. Like, I, I feel like that concept is a bit outdated, maybe, and I feel like even back then, if you like have any you know knowledge of history usually the older the older more um higher status men in society were getting away with some really bad stuff i understand the idea of glorifying beauty and and things like like pretty privilege right like that obviously is real but you don't you don't really see that with dorian you just hear that he's pretty and basil has like a boy crush on him and Everyone's like, oh yeah, you can steal all my money because you're pretty. Like that isn't really an exploration of that concept. That's a very like baseline, kind of just like in your face thing, you know? The themes of consequences of unchecked desires slash consequences of following the ego in its entirety and the theme of consequences of being impressionable and not having your own opinions and making up your own mind, I do agree with. Let's get into that. I'm gonna read literally what I wrote because I said it so well. Bear with me. So, the only theme I agree with the, is the idea of the negative consequences of influence. And while Wilde may not have intended this, and this may not have been visible during the 19th century, this communicated through cycles of toxic masculinity. Y'all, this is what I have to say. This book is a direct example of cycles that perpetuate, elongate, and, and construct the patriarchy. This is what we're talking about today. I don't know if y'all know, I don't know if you can see, but I have a degree in gender and sexuality studies, and I have a vast amount of books and a vast amount of knowledge about this kind of stuff. And when I was reading this book, I was getting so angry because nobody told me this. Nobody let me know. There was no trigger warning. But this book to me felt like an example of how the patriarchy stays in existence and how toxic masculinity cycles through generations of men and continues and feeds the patriarchy. This is what I wrote and I'm gonna read it because it was really good. It was really well written. This theme is about the construction, elongation, and perpetuation of the patriarchy through horrible men influencing impressionable men to be horrible too. Dorian could have been a normal guy if he hadn't been targeted by a toxic man, Lord Henry, into joining the patriarchal ranks of self-absorption, unchecked desires, your ego above everything. S example, how Dorian treats Sybil. Ends in engagement because she stops acting well. So his romance for her was based on her skills and actress. Nar, nar. Henry saw a man who could be powerful due to his money, beauty, and blank canvas of a personality, of a brain, of opinions, right? Dorian was incredibly impressionable and so young when Lord Henry sank his claws into him. Lord Henry, probably from past toxic men of the past, so generations of the past, learned hedonism and cynicism and cruelty and abuse of the system and taught it too. He sought out victims and found Dorian and knew, he saw, maybe in his subconscious, right? Maybe consciously who knows saw an opportunity to to continue the generations of toxic masculinity continue the strength of the patriarchy taking advantage of something that could become a powerful man somebody again with money beauty and not a thought in his brain and teaches him everything he knows in order to create like a duplicate robot in the army of the patriarchy, y'all. And that is what, this is this is why I made this video because I had, I had to share with the world that I think this book, all these themes and all these motifs and all the symbolism, it all comes down to cycles and generations of toxic masculinity of men who suck, teaching men how to suck so that the patriarchy continues to live on.
And I'm not gonna sit here and say like, Dorian is a bad man for taking on the influence of Lord Henry, for falling victim to his, you know, again, his claws sinking in, his influence. But I will say, there's no way Dorian didn't also see an opportunity to live a lifestyle where he gets everything he wants and does anything he wants. And that is why he chose Henry over Hallward. I struggle to believe that the heartbreak from Sybil being a bad actress and then killing herself because he was super mean to her actually made him decide to be a bad man. He found a book, his little evil Bible, and he had a voice from Lord Henry that sent him into the whirlpool of the patriarchy and he continues to feed it. And he kills two men, continuation of this theory, right? He kills two men at the end of the book. We hardly hear about all the evil things, but somehow we hear about these two men he kills that don't perpetuate the patriarchy directly. Obviously, you know, these are just book characters. Who knows what they've done off the page? But Basil Howard is a good guy. He's a painter. He does abstract art, he does mythological art, he's a good guy, good social standing, dead, cut. And then he kills James Vane, Sybil's brother, who kind of represents like men's, <laughs> men who see the crimes against women and who act upon it, dead. I'm sorry folks, I'm not gonna sit here and say that the main theme is about Dorian and his, you know, the red devil and the white devil on his shoulders, and it's, you know, Henry and Howard talking at him, and he chooses Henry. I'm not gonna say that's the main theme. I struggle to believe that. There are so many motifs and so many metaphors that implicate the continuation of cycles of patriarchy and bad men. <laughs> I got really fired up there, y'all. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It just, I know Oscar Wilde, has a lot of poems and short stories and such that have discussions about society, especially about men in society, right? Because he was put on trial for being queer and a lot of his stories have implications of like homoeroticism. And so of course he is going to recognize patriarchal cycles more than, you know, many men who are in the patriarchy would. And I wonder, I, I should do a dissertation on this. Let me tell you what. I wonder if Oscar Wilde writing this book maybe didn't know, maybe he did know, maybe nobody else knew and he did, who knows, who knows. I feel like he wrote this book trying to tell a story about the pain men feel who may not want to be a part of a toxic patriarchy and a toxic gender sphere, who are trying to break through, but the implications, the stones put on their backs force them to continue the generations of toxic masculinity. I just wonder, you know, like, of course Oscar Wilde is very accredited. This book is, is well known, well read, well researched, but I finished this book, I obviously I said the audiobook, but I, in my brain, <laughs> closed the book, and I thought to myself, I thought, wow, the cruelty men will do to other men when they are not servicing the patriarchy or when they could be a strength to the patriarchy but maybe aren't yet again i have chills like it's it's bombastic and I, that's really how i interpreted the story y'all this is not a gothic tale nothing about this is gothic to me this felt like a social study book this felt not scary it felt sad I was sad for Dorian at the end, and he was sad for himself too, I think. And that's what I have to say. <laughs> anyway, y'all, I'm gonna end the video here because I'm like getting hot in the face. I don't know if you can see, but I, I'm really passionate about this stuff. And I really just, I felt a little like an imposter doing a video essay, a book rant on the picture of Dorian Gray, which is like such an iconic classic book because I'm not an academic in literature. My degree is in gender studies, obviously, but I love reading and I, I really just wanted to share my thoughts on this book and how I interpreted it. And maybe I interpreted it different because I'm a woman. 
you know? Or maybe it has nothing to do with it because women live under the patriarchy too and we also construct and exploit and experience and elongate the patriarchy. So, you know, whatever. I don't know. This is just how I interpreted this book. I'm gonna end the video here. Dorian Gray was okay. I think I gave it two stars. I liked Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte more because <laughs> I love the drama. I live for the drama, y'all. But that's it. That's it for today. I'm gonna let y'all go. I hope you enjoyed this video. Feel free to give it a thumbs up, give it a comment, give it some love or don't, you know, I'm not your mother. I hope you enjoyed. I hope you have a great rest of your day. The sun went away while I was filming. I was like pretty and having yellow light on my face and now everything's gray. Dorian gray. <laughs> I hope you have a great rest of your day. And I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.